We had a beautiful dream, and that was all. Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the life of Queen Marie Antoinette and her voice for us today will be that of Donna ASMR, who was kind enough to accept my invitation to participate in this project. You probably know about her work already. There's a link to her channel in the description. Her videos are really top quality and I like them a lot, so I can only recommend you check her channel if you don't know it yet. Even if you are no expert in 18th century history, I am sure the name Marie Antoinette makes you think about a few images, maybe about movies you have seen, or this infamous quote, let them eat cake. Actually, she is certainly the most famous of all queens of France, but she is not remembered for what she did for her political significance. She is remembered for what she was. She turned into a cultural icon, in a sense, for the fancy life she had at the royal court in Versailles, for this incredible fall from the throne to the scaffold during the French Revolution. And this tragic fate is what we're going to explore together today. So, it's now time for you to adopt a comfortable position. I recommend you wear headsets to listen to this video. And you are invited to close your eyes and just let my voice guide you through this journey to the past. We're going to travel back in time more than two centuries and a half to 1755 when a young princess was born in Vienna. Austria. Marie Antoinette was the 15th child, yes, the 15th, of the reigning queen of Austria, Maria Theresa von Habsburg. And when she was born, she was as noble as you could get in the 18th century. Being a Habsburg, she belonged to one of the most prestigious and powerful dynasties in Europe. I told you about the Habsburgs in several of my history videos for centuries. The Habsburgs had been Archdukes of Austria, but they had extended their power and influence much beyond Austria. A branch of the family had ruled over Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries. They also had other territories like the south of the Netherlands, parts of Italy, Hungary, and many more possessions in the east of Europe. So that Maria Theresa was one of the most powerful and respected sovereigns in Europe. She developed an intense diplomatic activity in every corner of Europe, and she governed her international empire from Vienna. This is where Marie Antoinette was born, in the royal palace of the Habsburgs in the center of Vienna, the Hofburg, and she spent her early years in the Hofburg and in the summer palace, the palace of Schönbrunn, which is built close to Vienna. The education she received was far from flawless, and we will see that this will be important later. The education of princesses back then was a bit neglected. They were taught how to behave in the society, to be good Christians, to play music. They were taught a few foreign languages too, and Marie Antoinette was not particularly good at that. But they received absolutely no political or historical education which made them quite ignorant of the state of affairs in Europe or even in their own country. The destiny of a royal daughter back then was to be married for 
political or diplomatical reasons to a foreign king or prince, and this is what they were prepared to. But back then, in the 1750s, the possibility that one day the youngest daughter of Maria Teresa would become Queen of France looked almost impossible to imagine because France was an arch enemy of Austria. The two countries had been repeatedly at war since the 16th century and they were competing on the continent to be the leading uh, power. However, in the 1760s, when Marie Antoinette was still a child and completely ignorant of what was happening, a major reversal of alliances took place, especially after the Seven Years' War in the middle of the 18th century. Prior to this war and during this war, Austria was allied with England, the UK, and France was allied with Prussia. But both countries, France and Austria, were dissatisfied with their allies and they finally decided to make their own alliance together, coming much closer during the 1760s until a formal alliance was signed between the two countries. And it was common since uh, centuries to uh, solidify and symbolize an alliance between countries by organizing a royal wedding to officially bind the two ruling families. This is how young princess Marie Antoinette was promised to the heir to the French throne, the Dauphin, as he was called, the future Louis XVI. Until she was 15, Marie Antoinette enjoyed a relatively free and joyful life at the Austrian royal court. Contrary to Versailles, the French court that we will discover in a minute, the royal court in Vienna was much more intimate. The royal family could have a private life, there was little ceremonial and the everyday life of the royal family was not turned into a show like in Versailles. In 1770, with very little experience of life, because she had spent 15 years in this very particular environment, like a, a bubble, in which she was protected from every uh, external influence, Marie Antoinette was sent to France to marry the future king of France and uh, she would never come back to Vienna. In a symbolic ceremony, when she crossed the Rhine River, the natural frontier between Germany and uh, the Kingdom of France, she had to abandon all her belongings, everything she had taken from Vienna, and she was offered a, a completely new set of dresses and everything she may need for her new life. The journey to Paris and then Versailles continued and in May 1770, in a completely new environment in which she knew absolutely no one, she was married to the Dauphin of France, the heir to the throne, becoming the Dauphine, the future queen of France. At first, this new couple of complete strangers enjoyed a quite good popularity in the kingdom. They represented the future, the succession to the throne, and through this wedding, peace with Austria. So they were quite well received in the kingdom, especially in Paris. It is quite certain that in seeing the people who treat us so well, despite their own misfortune, we are more obliged than ever to work hard for the happiness. The Dauphin and the Dauphine may have been popular in the kingdom, but it doesn't mean that life was easy for young Marie Antoinette at the royal court in Versailles. First, because this represented a radical change in her environment,
permanent in her life and she knew no one. Remember, she was only 15 and she suddenly had to comply with a, an extensive list of codes of conduct, of uh, rituals to respect the so-called rival etiquette that organized life in the castle of Versailles. This meant very little privacy. For example, when she woke up in the morning, she could not get dressed by herself and alone. She had to participate in a ceremony in which representatives of noble families that were fighting for this privilege would hold her the pieces of cloth she needed. All of this in public in a bedroom that was uh, opened to uh, anyone who wanted to enter and attend this uh, morning ceremony. The meals were taken in public too and uh, you can imagine how intimidating that was for a young girl. But the worst was what happened or more precisely did not happen with uh, her husband. The night after the wedding the two were put in bed together and everybody assumed that uh, the consumption of this wedding would take place. But actually nothing happened because the two were inexperienced, they didn't know what to do. And then in the following days, then weeks, then months and then even years, this union remained uh, unconsumed. It would finally take years later an explanation to uh, the future king, Louis XVI, by one of Marie Antoinette's brothers, the future emperor of Austria, Joseph, for uh, the king to realize what he should do and uh, for this couple to finally consume their wedding. But in the meantime, you can imagine the pressure on this young lady being the wife of the King of France, her main uh, function, her destiny in the eye of everyone was to give children and especially male heirs to the King, which she proved uh, unable to do, probably more because of her husband, but she was uh, considered responsible for that. And this uh, problem totally poisoned her first years in Versailles to the point that it almost became a diplomatic problem and uh, rumors that this wedding could be uh, cancelled um, even appeared at some point. The pressure on her was uh, enormous until she finally became pregnant for the first time. Another problem she had when she started living in Versailles was that she made a couple of mistakes mistakes she cannot really be held responsible for, she was just unprepared. And uh, one particularity of life in Versailles was that maybe the codes, the etiquette were much stricter than in Vienna, but morality was much looser. And Marie Antoinette didn't know how to behave with the mistress of her stepfather, the king, Louis XV, the mistress of the king in the 1770s when she arrived in Versailles was Madame du Barry. Madame du Barry was remarkably beautiful. She also entertained the king quite a lot and this gave her a status, a certain influence at the royal court. But she also represented everything Marie Antoinette had been taught to ignore, to despise. She was not even noble, she had been offered a title by the king and everybody knew it. She was not known for her good manners, neither, and uh, for these reasons Marie Antoinette considered she shouldn't speak to her. But the problem is that given the protocol, Madame du Barry was not allowed to start speaking to the Dauphine before the Dauphine herself would have said something to her. But as Marie Antoinette continued to voluntarily ignore her, 
this uh, escalated, Madame du Barry started to complain to the king, and uh, this turned almost into a little diplomatic incident. At some point, her mother, Maria Teresa, had to write her to order that she uh, speaks to the king's mistress. I'm telling you about this incident because it shows how sometimes Marie Antoinette was humiliated, but it also contributed to deteriorate her reputation at the court. She started to build a reputation for being a bit stubborn, naive, and together with her absence of pregnancy, this contributed to isolate her. Finally, in 1774, after four years as Dauphine of France and as she was only 19, her stepfather, King Louis XV, died. Her husband succeeded to the throne, becoming King Louis XVI, and she became the new Queen of France. A new period was about to begin in her life. I am terrified of being bored. Once queen in 1774, and even more after her first pregnancy in 1778, when she was 23, and this released a lot of the pressure she had on her, that was only the first of several pregnancies she had in the 1780s, and she had several children. Marie Antoinette started to gain independence and be able to live more like she intended. She had very little interest in political matters or anything serious, actually. In fact, her mother and the ambassador of Austria in Paris often tried to use her to influence the king and change a bit the course of French politics to their advantage. She tried to cooperate, but never really gained much influence on uh, serious things. And instead, she quickly showed a preference for decoration, fashion, partying. She was not the first to face this, but that was a problem for the courtiers in Versailles. What to do with your life when you have uh, plenty of time, plenty of money for many of them, and uh, you don't know how to occupy your days. So there was a lot of partying, a lot of uh, shows organized, a lot of gambling at night. Almost on a daily basis, Marie Antoinette started to gamble like many courtiers and many other queens uh, before her. She also had a lot of interest in fashion and uh, started to change it in Versailles. It is due to her influence that the heavy makeup style of the previous decades was abandoned and replaced with a more natural style. She wore uh, spectacular wigs or haircuts and having a, a personal budget as the queen, she ordered a, a a huge number of outfits to fashion designers working in Paris. Given her status as the Queen of France in uh, the most influential uh, court of Europe, this uh, spread it to other countries and actually she can be credited for helping to boost, to develop this uh, sector of fashion, fragrances, and uh, luxury products in general, which still today remains a significant sector in the French economy. She also changed all the uh, etiquette and ceremonial in Versailles, at least uh, as much as she could, having uh, much more time for herself, much more uh, privacy, and this uh, might have helped her to uh, find a more balanced life but it also isolated her quite a lot and uh, she was often clumsy in uh, choosing her friends. She chose uh, friends and people around her much more based on their capacity to entertain her, to be uh, smart, funny, young.
young or good looking rather than the nobility they represented the political influence of the family they came from like queens traditionally did and in the process she generated a lot of jealousy frustration and uh, made a lot of enemies in the court but not only in the court in the country too in the 1780s the kingdom of france was going through difficult times economically and financially in particular the budget of the state was in constant deficit and uh, things like the participation to the american independence war supporting the insurgents in america had contributed to make public debt skyrocket to the point that it had become uncontrollable finding food every day had become a problem for a significant fraction of the population and beyond these economic or financial problems that can be temporary it is the core of the social order that was under criticism from intellectuals philosophers and uh, a rising social class the bourgeoisie who found the privileges of the nobility the absence of individual liberties unbearable in this context a court and especially a queen who was spending a lot of money just for her pleasure in a country that was struggling with economic problems and criticizing inequalities could only become very unpopular and this is what happened to the royal couple to parts of the nobility but in particular to marie antoinette because she made mistakes and probably did not realize how her behavior could uh, impact her public image but also because she was a woman and a foreigner some people started to call her l'autrichienne the austrian woman she became a target of gossiping um, and many rumors started to circulate about her for example in her uh, very close circle there was a uh, swedish young noble axel of fersen and uh, he was very good looking maybe uh, he was a romantic interest of hers at some point even though we have absolutely no uh, certainty about that it is very likely that nothing happened between the two but for the public opinion uh, he was her lover and uh, worse than that there were rumors that she participated in uh, orgies pornographic pictures started to uh, circulate showing her in uh, humiliating positions and uh, this hate towards the queen continued to mount very regularly in the 1780s until the revolution started by the end of the 1780s as the french revolution is about to begin and uh, make the entire life of marie antoinette collapse disappear she has started to change though she's been a mother several times she has also learned from the scandals of the uh, previous years one that is uh, still remembered today is the queen's necklace scandal something she was not responsible for it is just uh, people around her that used her name to uh, order the creation of an extremely expensive necklace of diamonds and uh, finally when the uh, the entire scandal was revealed she was uh, considered responsible by the public opinion even though she had had no knowledge of this story before so she has learned from that and started to understand that her public image was important however it's much too late and when the revolution begins in 1789 marie antoinette is now 34 and her life is about to become a nightmare
Let them eat cake. These words were attributed to Marie Antoinette, but she most certainly never said them. The context, supposedly, was that shortly after the beginning of the French Revolution, a group of women looking for bread walked from Paris to Versailles and uh, they intended to ask the royal family for uh, the bread they needed to feed their family. And Marie Antoinette would have asked, why are these uh, women complaining? Someone would have answered, because they had no bread. And uh, ironically, she would have uh, replied, then let them have cake. We know that this uh, is certainly not something she would have said, because the line comes from a book by French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, published ten years before, and it was attributed to a, a fictional princess in uh, the book. And second, she was certainly not a flawless character. She could be naive and shallow sometimes, very superficial, but she was not cynical at all, and this is not the kind of jokes she would have made. But still, it shows how unpopular uh, she could be when the revolution started, and this um, lack of popularity is only going to worsen during the first few years of the French Revolution. The revolution is the beginning of the end for the French monarchs, but this fall is going to take four long years of uh, disappointment, pain, doubts. And it begins uh, fairly quickly in the month following the storming of the Bastille in uh, 1789, which is generally considered to be the starting point of the revolution. The royal family is forced to uh, return to Paris, to abandon Versailles. They will never uh, return to uh, the place in which they lived uh, most of their life. Initially, the intention of the revolutionaries is not to eliminate the monarchy, but rather to change the regime from an absolute monarchy in which the king doesn't share any of its power into a uh, constitutional monarchy in which there is a parliament sharing power with the king but because of the education they have received, because of the life they have had, because of their vision of the world, both the king and the queen are going to reject any change in the political regime, any reduction in their power, and uh, until the end they are going to do everything in their power to fight, to undermine this revolution. They are going to collaborate to encourage as much as possible the countries that enter the war against revolutionary France, especially Austria. They both hope that the revolutionaries are going to lose the war, and they won't, uh, unfortunately for them. And this would mean a restoration of uh, the ancient regime in France, and uh, a restoration of their own personal power. After they've been relocated to Paris and forced to live in a, a palace that no longer exists uh, today, the palace of uh, the Tuileries. If you have ever been to Paris, this was touching the palace of the Louvre, which is a, a museum now. They will also try to escape the country discreetly. But unfortunately for them, this attempt is going to fail. They are captured before they have reached the frontier. And uh, instead of finding refuge abroad and uh, hoping to come back in the, with the armies of foreign powers, they are going to be imprisoned and never be free again. We had a beautiful dream, and that was all. I could not have any pleasure in the world if I abandoned my children. The royals' attempt to escape has contributed to radicalize the revolution. It is not the only reason, but uh, times have changed, and now 
given that the king has tried to betray the revolutionaries, the idea of the day is no longer to have a constitutional monarchy, but instead to uh, eliminate the monarchy and replace it with a republic. It seems that in this very chaotic environment and in this series of events, the royal couple has become much more closer to one another. They lived not like strangers, but they had little in common when they lived in Versailles before. Now they are acting together and uh, trying to support each other as much as possible. However, they're going to be imprisoned separately. The queen is separated from her children and uh, uh, the court is going to uh, uh, trial the king, Louis XVI, for uh, treason. He is found guilty and executed. The decision to execute the king or the ex-king is obviously a political one and uh, the intention of the revolutionaries that are now in charge and that are, as I said, much more radical than the early revolutionaries of the years 89 and 1991 is to reach a point of no return, a point of no return in the revolution itself. They want to eliminate the risk of having a king coming back later and threatening the newly born republic. And they also want a point of no return in the war against the enemies of revolutionary France and the enemies of revolutionary France are basically most other European countries that are now openly at war with uh, uh, the armies of the revolution. Once the king is dead, comes the question of what to do with the queen. Contrary to her husband, who was in charge, she had no political power, at least theoretically. So it's difficult to hold her responsible for any treason or a political decision that was taken by her husband. Of course, everybody knows that she strongly wished for the revolution to fail. She is uh, terribly unpopular too. But they lack uh, elements to convict her in a trial. However, her trial is going to take place and she's going to be charged with uh, treason, like her husband. This part of the accusation is actually extremely uh, thin. There are no elements in the possession of the revolutionaries that are going to judge her that would uh, prove she has committed anything. We now know, having found uh, archives in uh, Vienna in particular, that she wrote quite a lot of letters to uh, uh, send incentives to many other uh, monarchs in Europe, including her own uh, brother, who was the emperor of Austria, to attack and uh, defeat France. However, these elements were not in the possession of the, uh, of the court that is going to judge her. So the accusation is, uh, has nothing and uh, in order to try and compensate for this absence of material evidence they are going to attack her personally in a trial that is going to be extremely sad and unfair in a sense just uh, on legal grounds she would have certainly deserved to be uh, condemned on charges of treason but this couldn't be proved back then because they had no material element and they're going to charge her with accusations of incest, of having a, an inappropriate sexual behavior, things that are not backed by serious evidence at all, but are just here to try and fill this uh, accusation file that is extremely uh, thin. Even though she knows the outcome of this, because this is a political trial and this is not about her personally. Marie Antoinette is going to fight during the trial and fight so well and so bravely, actually. She seems to be starting to reveal herself in the last moments of her life. 
being uh, much braver and uh, smarter than people would have imagined given the background she had before. So she's going to fight back during the trial so much that many people attending this trial will uh, believe until the sentence, the death sentence is announced, that she's going to walk free out of it or at least avoid death. But she had uh, understood what was happening and uh, had no more illusions at this point. I was a queen and you took away my crown, a wife and you killed my husband, a mother and you deprived me of my children. My blood alone remains, take it, but do not make me suffer long. On the morning of October 1793, Marie Antoinette, who is now 38, begins her last day. She is transported from the prison to the scaffold. The execution is public, like uh, her husband's. And uh, during the entire trip to the scaffold, she is exposed to the hate screams of the crowd. The crowd hates everything she is and uh, everything she represents. This is how she's going to die, bravely, under the guillotine. And like during the trial, she's going to stay brave and calm until her last moment. Courage. I have shown it for years. Think you I shall lose it at the moment when my sufferings are the end? The blade of the guillotine has fallen. The Queen of France has died. And it's now time for her to... Enter the legend. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, that you found it interesting. I'd like to thank Donna again for her contribution. It's been a pleasure doing this with her. And I'll see you soon for a new video. Au revoir.